That history cannot erase With iron heel and iron hand The Roman popes rule the land Those ignorant of history May be swept into apostasy We won't be loved by Rome, sweet lie With fifty million reasons why Salvation is by faith alone, in Christ alone, by grace alone. A sovereign God give faith to man. Salvation's in the Maker's hand. This gospel offends Rome today. They offer up another way, a counterfeit. A compromise Beware the ancient Papal lie With such a cloud Of witnesses Who by grace Died in their Lord Recall their Memory to say By the same Faith we live today Hello and welcome everybody To a new broadcast from Juggler 66 I was already some days, some weeks even, thinking about doing a video on a person um, that I've met not so long ago. I think it was just uh, last year that I got to know him a little bit. And I'm talking about Ian Paisley. Ian Paisley is uh, probably for a lot of people not that uh, very well known. Even I didn't know him that well. But uh, the more I studied the New World Order and the Antichrist, I also came again. Uh, I also came to meet Ian Paisley to get to know Ian Paisley, and um, he died last year in September 12, 2014. And um, I have an audio where he preaches against the Jesuit Order. Now, there are not so many Europeans, and certainly not European politicians, and very certainly not European politicians in quite high positions. He was not only the Prime Minister of Ireland, he was also a member of the European Parliament. And to have people in that institution and to tell the truth is something very rare. So for everybody who does not know Ian Paisley, I want to bring him a little bit closer to you. And I want to read two obituaries, where even one of the obituaries comes from, believe it or not, the BBC. So before anything else, I will start reading the obituary coming from the BBC. And uh, I will of course provide the link in the description box of this video that you can find it for yourself and read it for yourself. So this was written on the 12th of September 2014 by the BBC of Northern Ireland. Ian Paisley was famous for his thunder. He was known to his supporters as the big man 
whose most reported words were no, never and not an inch. Yet in a political career that spanned nearly 40 years, he went from throwing snowballs at one Irish Prime Minister to embracing another one, from political Neverman to Northern Ireland's First Minister. He ended up leading a power-sharing executive at Stormont, although he had supported the strike to bring one down 30 years earlier. His biggest turnaround came when, as a leader of hardline unionism, he sat down with Gary Adams his former bitter enemy, the leader of militant republicanism, as the Democratic Unionist Party and Sinn Féin decided to work together in an executive. It seemed unimaginable to supporters who had followed him through years of protests that as Northern Ireland's First Minister he would enjoy an easy relationship with his Deputy First Minister, Sinn Féin's Martin McGuinness, so much that they became known as the Chuckle Brothers. With his thunderous rhetoric and his bull-like voice, Ian Paisley was always the epitome of an American Deep South preacher. He was born in 1926 in Armagh. His father was a Baptist minister and his mother was a preacher, Presbyterian, I've learned. He grew up <coughs> in Ballymena, which was to become his political power base. But before politics he was a preacher, delivering his first sermon aged 16 in the mission hall in County Tyrone. He was just 25 years old when he founded the Free Presbyterian Church. His early reputation as a Protestant extremist was forged in the 1960s. He once produced a Roman Catholic Eucharist wafer during a televised speech to the, union, to the Oxford Union, mocking it and those who believed it sacred. When Irish Prime Minister Sean Limas was invited to Belfast in 1965 by Northern Ireland Prime Minister Terence O'Neill, Paisley was furious and led 1,000 loyalists to Stormont to demonstrate. Two years later, he famously threw snowballs at another Irish Prime Minister, Jack Lynch, when he visited Northern Ireland. He often took to the streets. He was sent to prison for six weeks for unlawful assembly when he organized a demonstration on November 30th, 1968 and forced civil rights marchers to cut short their parade in the city of Armagh. He was labeled a bully boy, but thousands protested at his imprisonment. The membership of his church doubled and on his release he was greeted as a martyr. He stood as a protestant unionist and was elected to the Stormont Parliament in 1970. Two months later, he took the North Antrim seat at Westminster. It was said his maiden speech in the House of Commons could be heard in the Lords as well and was received in almost complete silence. Yeah, when somebody speaks the truth, there's nothing not much you can say against it, right? By 1971, he had founded the Democratic Unionist Party, the DUP, and began a long battle with the Ulster Unionist Party, the UUP, for the trust of the Unionist electorate. He opposed the formation of a power-sharing executive at Stormont in 1973 and became involved in the Ulster Workers' Council strike that brought Northern Ireland to a standstill and led to the executive's collapse. In 1979, in his first European election, he topped the poll. He may have been anti-European, but won a reputation as a hard-working member of European Parliament who lobbied for all his constituents, regardless of their religion. Though he could be kindly and amusing in private, to his enemies and critics Ian Paisley was a sinister figure, a bigot and a dangerous presence. They pointed to his involvement in Ulster resistance. In 1981 he organized a demonstration of 500 men who paraded late at night on a country Antrim hillside, brandishing gun licenses. The signing of the Anglo-Irish Agreement in 1985 saw him join forces with the then Ulster Unionist leader James Molyneux. Thousands attended a protest meeting under the banner Ulster Says No in Belfast city centre. Together the two leaders adopted a policy of non-cooperation, resigned their Westminster seats and forced by elections which they later contested and won. The move was not a universal success from the Unionist viewpoint, 
as they lost the newly the Newry and Amark seat to the SDLP. Ultimately, the Molyneux Paisley relationship turned sour when it became clear the Ulster Unionists were willing to go to Dublin to talk to the Irish government while the DUP was not. Paisley famously called Molyneux a Judas Iscariot, a slight that hurt Molyneux deeply. Yeah, the truth hurts, doesn't it? <laughs> he was totally opposed to the 1993 Downing Street Declaration between the British and Irish governments and one meeting with John Major ended abruptly with the DUP being asked to leave. The party was convinced a secret deal had been done to secure the 1994 IRA ceasefire. Paisley opposed the peace process from the beginning. He agreed to attend talks at Stormont in 1996, but when Sinn Féin was allowed in the following year, he walked out. He came back on the night before Good Friday 1998 to register his disgust. The Good Friday Agreement brought uh, Mr. Paisley into a battle for votes with Molyneux's successor as Ulster Unionist leader David Trimble. Three years earlier, they had staged a triumphal march at Drumcree, leading Orangemen down the Garvagy Road. Now they were facing up to each other. The Yes camp won, and in a new assembly, the DUP was in the same political arena as Sinn Féin, even if they did not sit around a cabinet table together. Ian Paisley never hid his hatred of republicanism, but he did nominate two DUP ministers to a new executive. When it was suspended and a new election loomed, the DUP overtook the Ulster Unionist at the polls. Mr. Paisley's hardline stance of no surrender and not an inch seemed gradually less sure in his final years as other parties inched towards accommodation. He decided not to stand again for the European Parliament in 2004. The election the following year saw the DUP become the largest unionist party in Northern Ireland, displacing the Ulster Unionist who had dominated the unionist vote since partition. Since partition, yeah. In his career, he launched countless attacks on Catholicism and Irish republicanism. He condemned the Pope and the Roman Catholic Church as the Whore of Babylon and staged a one-man protest against the Pope when the Pontiff addressed the Strasbourg Parliament in October 1988. Now, a video, uh, a link to the video where he does that in the European Parliament will be included in the description box of the video, so make sure that you watch that. And I am very cur curious if we will ever see a person doing the same when the Antichrist Pope Francis will address a speech to the Joint Session of Congress on the United States later in September this year. But okay, getting on reading. The leader of the Free Presbyterian Church denounced the pontiff as an Antichrist and got bundled out of the chamber by scandalized colleagues. However, he later astounded his critics by meeting the Irish Catholic primate Sean Brady at Stormont in 2006. And in May 2007, Ian Paisley became First Minister of Northern Ireland with Sinn Féin's Martin McGuinness as the Deputy First Minister. A year later, he stepped down from that role, handing over the reins to Peter Robinson, who also succeeded him as a leader of the DUP. In 2010, he took a seat in the House of Lords, where he was formerly known as Lord Bernside of North Antrim. Mr. Paisley would subsequently claim that he was forced out by the party, blaming Mr. Robinson and the DUP Member of Parliament Nigel Dodds for ousting him. Both men denied this, of course. They <laughs> always deny. <laughs> he leaves a wife, Eileen, who is a baroness and five children. Eileen was never far from his sight, and his favorite slogan at election time was Vote for my wife's husband. The DUP remains the largest party in Northern Ireland and the dominant force in unionism. Despite poor health and advancing years, he never lost his thunder. Speaking about death, during one of his sermons he said, quote, If you hear in the press that Ian Paisley is dead, don't believe a word of it. I'll be more alive than ever. I'll be singing as I sang never before. End quote. 
Now I will read some text and some quotes from another obituary that comes from the irishtimes.com. Ian Paisley, never, 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 and other notable quotes. And then I will let Ian Paisley speak on the subject of the Jesuits, which you are probably already waiting for after my introduction. So just keep on for a few moments. From the obituary 2 we read, He was probably the most fiery, uncompromising and bellicose Ulster politician throughout the Troubles. Here are some of his most memorable quotes. Quote, they breed like rabbits and multiply like vermin. Unquote. Talking about Catholics at a Loyalist rally in 1969. Save the Ulster from sodomy, his slogan in a 1970 <coughs> and 80s campaign against legalizing homosexuality. Save Ulster from sodomy. He uses the biblical explanation of homosexuality, which is sodomy, and I applaud him very, very much for that. Quote, I am not going to sit down with bloodthirsty monsters who have been killing and terrifying my people, unquote, opposing demands to sit down and talk with Sinn Féin. Quote, the scarlet woman of Rome, unquote, his description of Pope John Paul. Quote, I denounce you Antichrist. I refuse you as Christ's enemy and Antichrist with all your false doctrine. Unquote. Addressing Pope John Paul II on a visit to the European Parliament in October 1988. And you have the video to come back to and try to listen to that. Quote, this Romish man of sin is now in hell. Unquote. On the death of Pope John the Twenty-Third. Quote. Protect us from the shackles of priestcraft. Unquote. Late 1970s in an attack on the Roman Catholic Church. Quote. The breath of Satan is upon us. Unquote. The, his remark when he entered a Belfast press conference in a smoke-filled, whiskey southern hall in the mid-1970s. And I think he was very aware of the Jesuits', uh, Jesuits favorite method of killing and assassinating when he stated, quote, Because it would be too hard for you to poison them, unquote, when asked why he had chosen boiled eggs for breakfast during a top-level meeting at the Irish Embassy in London. Quote, I believe that Northern Ireland has come to a time of peace, a time when hate will no longer rule. How good it will be to be part of a wonderful healing in our province. Unquote. During his inaugural speech as First Minister or Prime Minister of Northern Ireland. All of the words uttered in the God-given rasping tones of Mr. Paisley, none was so famous as no. He said no to marches demanding civil rights for Catholics. He said no to the flying of Ireland's tricolor in Belfast. He said no to the lowering of the Union Jack above Belfast City Hall after the death of Pope John the Twenty-Third. He said no to the legislation of homosexuality. Quote, Save Ulster from sodomy, unquote, as he put it. He even said no when a Catholic politician, John Hume, asked, Ian, if the word no were to be removed from the English language, you'd be speechless, wouldn't you? Unquote. <laughs> and his answer was, no. <laughs> I love this man. But Mr. Paisley was not just a naysayer. He was also a doer. Scotting a circus tent in Belfast Park, the young minister quickly secured for an evangelical rally that drew a thousand people. Restlessly, rather than just delivering his sermons indoors, he would take it to the streets, there to mount his attack on the battlements of hell, sin and apostasy. Nor did he just stay put in Belfast, but would go on preaching tours round the province. 
and everywhere he went for his ministry he would make contacts that would be useful in politics. Astutely, he saw that the established unionism defended the secular but not the religious interests of Protestants. <laughs> the religious interests of Protestants are nowhere defended, in my opinion. Yet, in this conservative corner of Britain, protected, he believed, by divine providence and, quote, with more born-again people to the square mile than anywhere else in the world, unquote, the Protestants' religion was an inseparable part of their identity. He would fight for it. That meant two things. First, he would carry the sword for the true faith, which meant doing battle with the Catholic Church, that, quote, bloodthirsty, persecuting, intolerant, blaspheming, political, religious papacy, unquote, with its, quote, beads, holy water, holy smoke and stinks, unquote. Later, it also meant interrupting Pope John Paul II in the European Parliament with cries of, I denounce you as Antichrist, unquote. And so much for this little um, introduction, let's call it, on Ian Paisley. And now, to know what he really stood well for, let's hear Ian Paisley himself. Mr. Ian Paisley, I am very sorry that you are not with us anymore, but you've gone to sleep and probably awaiting the resurrection at the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's a shame I have never known you and it is an honor for me to give you the floor now to let hear your speech on the Jesuits on the Jogler 66 channel. Please, Mr. Paisley, enlighten us with your views on the Jesuits. Here he comes. And his murder man, an exposure of the Jesuits. Recently, at a press conference in the Stormont Parliament buildings, I dealt with a political statement made by Bishop Cathal Daly of the Roman Catholic Hierarchy in Ireland. The bishop had put forth four propositions. Number one, that Mrs. Thatcher, the British Prime Minister's art, art, art statement rejecting the proposals of the New Ireland Forum for a united Ireland played into the hands of the IRA. Two, that all unionists who rejoiced at that statement should be bracketed with the IRA as extremists. Three, that Roman Catholics in Northern Ireland were denied real rights and democracy. Four, that the Dublin government had just as much right in the North as have the British government. That final proposition, by the way, is a treasonable doctrine which would morally justify an invasion by the South of the North of Ireland. Commenting, I called the bishop the black pope of the Republican movement. The press men present threw up their hands in seeming horror, but none of them knew who the p black pope was. I explained that the black pope was the name given uh, to the head of the Jesuit order, the most powerful order within the Roman Catholic system. In an aside, I might say that the bishop should have felt very pleased that I had elevated him so high up in the hierarchy of the church to which he belongs. Then, when I explained to the press who the black pope really was, the head of the Jesuits, they again said, who are the Jesuits? And I described them as the Gestapo of the Roman Catholic Church, the front men who carry out the Pope's orders throughout Christendom. Again the press men represented threw up their hands in seeming horror and uh, said this was a terrible thing uh, to say about any order within the Roman Catholic Church. 
But what are the facts? I quote from the secret history of the Jesuits by Edmund Paulus. I'm giving a quotation from the Reform, which is what the press of the Spanish dictator Franco published on the 3rd of May, 1945, the day of Hitler's death. Quote, Adolf Hitler, son of the Catholic Church, died while defending Christianity. It is therefore understandable that words cannot be found to lament over his death when so many were found to exalt his life. Over his mortal remains stands his victorious moral figure. With the palm of the martyr, God gives Hitler the laurels of victory. End of the quotation. Then in page 166 of the same book, we read the statement of Walter Skellenberg, former chief of German counter-espionage, who had the complete confidence of Hitler. After the war, Schellenberg wrote, quote, The SS organization, that is the Gestapo, had been constituted by Himmler according to the principles of the Jesuits' order. Their regulations and the spiritual exercises prescribed by Ignatius of Loyola were the model Himmler tried to copy exactly. The Reichsfuhrer SS, Himmler's title as Supreme Chief of the SS, was to be the equivalent of the Jesuits' general. End of the quotation. Let me give a final quotation from the leading Jesuit, Michael Scamios, who eventually became a cardinal in the church. He says, the National Socialist Movement, that is the fascist movement of Hitler, is the most vigorous and massive protest against the spirit of the 19th and 20th centuries. A compromise between the Catholic faith and liberal thinking is impossible. Nothing is more contrary to Catholicism than democracy. The reawakened meaning of strict authority opens up again the way to the real interpretation of ecclesiastical authority. The mistrust of liberty is founded on the Catholic doctrine of original sin. The Nationalist Socialist Commandments and those of the Catholic Church have the same aim. End of the quotation. These quotations alone prove conclusively that my definition of the Jesuits was a correct one. As a result of this controversy, many questions have been asked and of course a whole series of attacks have been made upon my person and also upon my stand. So I believe it is incumbent upon me to deal with the Jesuits, to say something of their history, something of their doctrines, and something of their program. On one of the walls of the Church of the Jesuits in Rome, there is a unique plaster cast. It depicts one of the saints of the Roman Catholic Church, Ignatius Loyola himself, with his foot on the neck of Protestantism. In St. Peter's itself, there is a colossal idol of the same Roman saint. He is depicted there in monkey's gown and cowl. A large open book rests on his left arm. On the first page are the words in Latin, To the greater glory of God. On the opposite page, also in Latin, Constitutions 
of the society of Jesus. The devil stands before him with a Jesuit's face. Hair divided as long tongues of fire. Left hand clenched and held close to the mouth. By the right holds a closed book with the fingers within it. A serpent with awful head and teeth is beneath. These two pieces of a Roman idolatrous sculpture are very significant. This Roman manufactured saint, Ignatius Loyola, was the founder of the Jesuit order, or the Society of Jesus, as he blasphemously called it. Its purpose is to stamp on the neck of Protestantism. The idol in St. Peter's has monk, devil, and serpent united. Excellent representatives of the devilish character of the Jesuit. Every Jesuit is outwardly a monk, inwardly a devil, and altogether a serpent. It is the Jesuits who control Rome's ecumenical movement. When the second Pope John the Twenty Third set up the Vatican Secretariat for Unity, he made Cardinal Bia, a German Jesuit, its president. This is deeply significant. As a leading Jesuit cardinal, Bia had at his disposal the great aspiring in Europe, his own society, to feed back to him all the vital information concerning the leadership and vulnerability of the great Protestant denominations, which he was aiming to subvert to the papacy. Bia's success was astounding. Archbishop Fisher visited the Pope and appointed an association with his successor, Archbishop Ramsey, then Archbishop of York, one Canon Polly of Ely Cathedral, to be personal representative of Canterbury and York at the Secretariat, over which Bia presides in Rome. Cardinal Bia was also received at Lambeth Palace by Dr. Ramsey, and no doubt from the Vatican side was responsible for Dr. Ramsey's visit to the Pope. Those visits herald a succession of visits by Archbishops of Canterbury. Dr. Fisher was the first in a long queue of professed Protestant church leaders who lined up at the Vatican to slaver on the Pope's slippers. These included Dr. Jackson of the Southern Baptist Convention of the United States of America, Dr. Lichtenberger, presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church of the USA, a president of the British Methodist Conference, and Dr. A.C. Craig, moderator of the Church of Scotland. In Ireland, another Jesuit priest, Michael Hurley, was the leader in subverting the main Protestant denominations, to Rome. As far back as 1963, he issued a book called Praying for Unity, in which he made it crystal clear that the ultimate purpose of the January week of prayer was the union of all Protestant denominations with Rome under the sovereign leadership of the Pope. His Jesuitical cunning was demonstrated by his success in obtaining for his book introductory messages by George Otto Sims, Church of Ireland, Archbishop of Dublin at that time. W. A. Montgomery, moderator of the Irish Presbyterian Church at that time. And Frederick E. Hill, president of the Irish Methodist Church at that time. The only Protestant church in Ireland attacked by this Jesuit production was the Free Presbyterian Church of Ulster, of which I am honored to be moderator. One of the contributors was priest Dennis Fall, soon to be known as the infamous Republican apologist and reviler of the Royal Ulster Constabulary. 
as can be expected, the book was the usual concoction of lies in which all Jesuits revel. We wrote to the author, challenging him on the issue, but he couldn't even reply. He couldn't answer. He was a peddler of lies. Of course, any man who blasphemously claims to turn a pancake or wafer in the bass into Jesus Christ and forgive sins could write or claim anything. What has been described by the Church of Ireland Gazette as a representative ecumenical gathering in Drogheda was organized by the same Jesuit Hurley. The meeting was held in a convent school of the Roman Catholic Presentation Sisters and clergy of the Irish Episcopal Church, the Church of Ireland, the Irish Presbyterian Church, and the Irish Methodist Church joined with Romanists in unity discussions. Two Irish Presbyterian professors, Barclay and McFadden, took a prominent part in that discussion. A few days later, the hypocrite Professor Barclay wrote to the press declaring there was no retreat to Rome. How naive does he think Ulster Protestants are? In England, the Jesuit Thomas Corbishley was the leader. The fact that he preached from the pulpit of Westminster Abbey showed how powerful his influence was. The tremendous protest in which we had the honor of taking part must have been a very bitter pill for him to swallow. The far-reaching effect of that protest can be gauged from the following extract of the National Daily Paper of the Sun. I quote from January the 24th, 1966. Today the Pope told more than 7,000 pilgrims gathered in St. Peter's Square. We must pray for the unity of all separated Christians. As you know, the problem of the union of all Christians is of grave importance and great immediacy. But we must confront it, even if it gives rise to so many difficulties, and perhaps the hour is near. The paper comments, the Pope's words about so many difficulties, some Vatican officials believe, may have referred to such incidents as the one in London on Friday night, when a group of die-hard Protestants demonstrated outside Westminster Abbey while a Jesuit priest was preaching there. The Anglican Bishop Hudson of Hereford joined the Jesuit Corbishley at a unity service in Birmingham. Later I debated Corbishley at Queen's University. In the light of these facts, that the Jesuits spearheaded Rome's ecumenical movement to take over the main Protestant denominations. We would do well to take a closer view of the Jesuits and their working, especially in view of the storm of protest that has come about when I called Carol Daly the Black Pope of the Republican movement. We will consider then the start the sign, the system, the secrecy, and the strategy of the Jesuits. First then, the start of the Jesuits. Ignatius Loyola, the founder of the Society of Jesus, was born eight years after the great German reformer Martin Luther. He belonged to an ancient Spanish family. He became a soldier and was severely wounded in one engagement in which he greatly distinguished himself. During the tedious illness resulting from his wound, he read Roman Catholic literature. This resulted in his embracing a stern asceticism. For a time he lived in a cave and took to extreme penances. This led to morbid broodings. His imagination ran riot. On one occasion we are informed he saw the Holy Spirit in the form of three notes closely bound together, hanging on a stock. And to his holy eyes, moreover, the host was transformed into the true God-man. The fanaticism resulting from such visions inspired Ignatius and his followers 
to diabolical deeds on behalf of the Roman Catholic system. During this time, Loyola conceived the plan of a new society which was to combat the Reformation. On August the 15th, 1534, Ignatius and six associates dedicated themselves in the crypt of the Notre Dame de Montmartre. In 1537, they offered themselves to the Pope and declared that they would raise a mighty army of holy knights whose sole aim would be to overthrow all the enemies of the Church of Rome. Pope Paul III gladly accepted their services especially as the order swore explicit military obedience, not merely canonical, to him and gave all its services entirely without money and without price. A papal bull which bore the title Raised to the Government of the Church Militant constituted the order on September the 27th, 1540. The bull declared that the persons enrolled were constituted an army, to bear the standard of the cross, to wield the arms of God, to serve the only Lord God and the Roman Pontiff, his vicar on earth. So started the most murderous and diabolical society to whom the Roman harlot ever gave birth. Secondly, the sign of the Jesuits. When the original group met in the crypt of Notre Dame, de Montmartre, rose from their knees. Ignatius pointed to the letters on the altar, IHS. These stand for Jesus, Hamadon, Salvatore, Jesus the Savior of mankind. And they shall henceforth be the model of our institution. IHS is a sign of the Jesuits. These letters do not stand for what Ignatius affirmed. They are in fact the pagan mystical symbol of the Egyptian trinity. Isis, Horus, and Zeb, the mother, child, and father of the gods. No honest person could imagine that this double sense is accidental. IHS pay the semblance of a tribute to Christianity, but they are in reality the substance of devil worship. The cloven hoof is upon them. I would advise everyone to read Hislop's two Babylons on this subject. Yes, and wherever these mystic letters, IHS, the sign of the Jesuits are found, be sure that sooner or later those using them will be revealed as doing the work of the Jesuits. These are the first symbols erected in Protestant churches by the Romanizing clergy. Let them be kept out of every Protestant church, for the substance will follow the sign as sure as night follows day. 3. The system of the Jesuits. The Jesuitical system is one of dissimulation, hypocrisy, and immorality. A book called The Secreta Monitor a copy of which is in the British Museum, contains instructions for the operation of the Jesuit system. The book is a masterpiece of diabolical deception. As might be expected, the book has been repudiated by the Jesuits. In its 18th chapter, it states curiously enough that this repudiation must take place if it should be discovered. The evidence of the genuineness of the book is incontrovertible. What is more, the Jesuits have always worked along the lines laid down in its corrupting pages. Jesuitism has three great governing principles. One, the doctrine of probability. Two, the doctrine of philosophical sin. Three, the doctrine of the direction of attention. One, the doctrine of probability. The Jesuits' own interpretation of it is that when, upon any moral question, two different opinions are entertained by any celebrated casuist, of which opinions the one is more probable and in conformity with the law, the other less probable but more agreeable to our desires, we may lawfully put the latter in practice. 
even of two contradictory probable opinions, says the Jesuit Paul Lehman, touching the legality or illegality of any human action, every one may follow in practice or in action that which he should prefer, although it may appear to the agent himself less probable in theory. The Jesuit Gasnevi goes further even than this, for he says that whosoever says that the law is not binding cannot sin. In other words, any plausible excuse whatever is a sufficient excuse for sin. Secondly, the doctrine of philosophical sin. By this doctrine the Jesuits mean any action contrary to the dictates of nature and right reason may be done by a person who is ignorant of the written law of God or doubtful of its meaning. Ignorance or doubt, therefore, according to this doctrine, alters the character of sin. Three, the doctrine of the direction of attention. The meaning of this doctrine is that actions intrinsically evil and directly contrary to the divine laws may be innocently performed by those who have so much power over their own minds as to join even ideally a good end to the wicked action contemplated. That is to say, let a man only stifle his conscience, or divert his thoughts for the time from his sin to some other object, or seek some good end, and he may do what he will. By these doctrines, the Jesuits in their writings show how every one of the Ten Commandments can be broken without sin. It was Cardinal Manning, running true to Jesuitical principles, who said of the authors of the Jesuit gunpowder plot, While on earth they wore the garb of felons, in heaven they stand arrayed in white and crowned. Here they are arrayed in a dock as malefactors. There they sit by the throne of the Son of God. The late Lord Palmerston once said, the presence of the Jesuits in any country, Catholic or Protestant, is likely to breed social disturbance. A French Roman Catholic priest, Arnold, warned, Do you wish to provoke revolution? To produce the total ruin of your country? Call in the Jesuits. The character of the order can be proved by the historical fact that up to the year 1860, no fewer than 70 times it had been expelled from countries in which it had been working. What is more, in 1773, Pope Clement XIV abolished the order altogether. Pope Clement met with a cruel death as a result. In 1814, Pope Pius VII restored the order, declaring that if any should again attempt to abolish it, he would incur the indignation of Almighty God and of the holy apostles Peter and Paul. Jesuit Ray spawned the whole of the Irish Republican murder movement. The IRA has been taught and has imbibed its principles. Let me give you three quotations from leading Jesuit theologians. Martin Beacon, in his work on theology, has the following passage. Every subject may kill his prince when the latter has taken possession of the throne as a usurper. And history teaches, in fact, that in all nations, those who kill such tyrants are treated with the greatest honor. But even when the ruler is not a usurper, but a prince who has by right come to the throne, he may be killed as soon as he oppresses his subjects with improper taxation, sells the judicial offices, and issues ordinances in a tyrannical manner for his own particular benefit. End of the quotation. 
of that terrorist organization justifying their campaign of murder are but echoes of the principles of the Jesuit order. We turn now to the secret of the Jesuits, my fourth point. Bishop Wordsworth, an eminent Church of England divine, and for some years the Bishop of Lincoln, uncovers the secrecy of the Jesuits in the, the exposure of a document used by them in their early days to compel Protestants to submit to Mother Church. This makes very illuminating reading. Roman Catholic Confession publicly prescribed and proposed to Protestants on their admission to the Roman Catholic Church. 1. We confess that we have been brought from heresy to the true saving Roman Catholic faith by the singular care of our supreme governors, spiritual and temporal, and by the diligence and aid of our masters, the fathers of the order of Jesuits. And we desire to certify this by our vows to the world at large. Two, we confess that the Pope of Rome is head of the church and cannot err. Three, we confess and are certain that the Pope of Rome is vicar of Christ and has plenary power of remitting and retaining the sins of all men according to his will, of thrusting them down to hell and of excommunicating them. Four, we confess that whatever new thing the Pope ordains, whether it be in Scripture or not in Scripture, and whatever he commands is divine, and therefore ought to be held by lay people in greater esteem than the precepts of the living God. 5. We confess that the Most Holy Pope ought to be honored by all with divine honor, with greater genuflection due to Christ himself. 6. We confess and assert that the Pope as our Most Holy Father is to be obeyed in all things without any exception, and that such heretics as contravene his orders are not only to be burnt, but to be delivered body and soul to hell. 7. We confess that the reading of Holy Scripture is the origin of heresy and schism and the source of blasphemy. 8. We confess that to invoke saints male and female, to honor their images, to kneel before them, to make pilgrimage to them, to light candles to them, is good, pious, holy, and useful. 9. We confess that every priest is much greater than the Mother of God, the Blessed Virgin Mary, who once brought forth Christ, and once only, but a priest of Rome, not only when he wills, but whenever he wills, offers and creates Christ, and consumes him when created. 10. We confess that to celebrate masses, and to distribute alms, and to pray for the dead, is useful. 11. We confess that the Pope has power of changing Scripture, and of adding to it, and taking from it according to his will. 12. We confess that souls after death are purified in purgatory, and that the masses of priests are useful to deliver them from it. 13. We confess that to receive the Eucharist under one kind is good and salutary, and to receive it under both is heretical and damnable. 14. We confess and assert that they who receive under one kind receive the whole Christ with flesh and blood, with the divinity and bones, but that they who receive under both only enjoy and eat bare bread. Fifteen, we confess that there are seven true and real sacraments. Sixteen, we confess that God is honored in images, and through them is acknowledged by men. Seventeen, we confess that Mary the Blessed Virgin is worthy of greater honor than men and angels, than Christ himself, the Son of God. Eighteen, we confess that the Blessed Virgin Mary 
is queen of heaven, and reigns together with her son, and that her son ought to act in all things according to her will. 19. We confess that the bones of the saints have great virtue, and therefore ought to be honored by men, and chapels ought to be built for them. 20. We confess that the Roman doctrine is Catholic, pure, divine, saving, ancient, and true. And the Protestant, false, erroneous, blasphemous, accursed, heretical, pernicious, seditious, and fabulous. Since, therefore, entirely and fully, in all its developments, the Roman doctrine under one kind is good and salutary, therefore we curse all those who brought us up in the country and pious heresy under both kinds. We pronounce our parents accursed, who educated us in that heretical faith. We curse those also who excited in us any doubts concerning the Roman Catholic faith, and those also who served us with that accursed cup. Yea, we curse ourselves and pronounce ourselves accursed because we partook in that heretical cup which we ought not to have tasted. 21. We confess that Holy Scripture is imperfect and a dead letter until it is explained by the Supreme Pontiff and allowed by him to be read by the laity. 22. We confess that one Mass of a Roman priest is more useful than a hundred and more Protestant sermons. Wherefore we curse those books which we have read, containing that heretical and blasphemous doctrine. We extend our curse to all our own works, performed by us in heresy, that they may not bring anything upon us in the last day in the divine presence. All these things we do with sincere heart, affirming that the Church of Rome in these and like articles is most true with a solemn recantation of that other heretical doctrine. In your hearing, honorable men and matrons, young men and virgins who are here present, we swear also that we will never return to the heresy under both kinds as long as we live, although it were allowed or shall be allowed to us to do so. We swear also that as long as a drop of blood remains in our veins, we will persecute that accursed Protestant doctrine by all means in our power, secretly and openly, by violence and stratagem, by word and deed, even with the sword. Finally, we swear, in the divine presence and in that of angels and of yourselves, that we will never depart from this saving and divine Roman Catholic Church, and never will return to the accursed Protestant heresy, nor embrace it. This is the true face of Jesuitry. No wonder Nicolini, the historian of the order, states, Draw the character of the Jesuit as he seems in London, and you will not recognize the portrait of the Jesuit in Rome. The Jesuit is the man of circumstances, despotic in Spain, constitutional in England, republican in Paraguay, bigot in Rome, idolater in India. He will assume and act out in his own person all those different features by which men are usually distinguished from each other. He will accompany the gay women of the world to the theater and will share in the excess of the debauchee. With solemn countenance, he will take his place by the side of the religious man at church, or revel in the tavern with the glutton or sot. He dresses in all garbs, speaks all languages, knows all customs, is present everywhere, though nowhere recognized. And all this it would seem, O oh, monstrous blasphemy, for the greater glory of God. The Jesuits backed the Inquisition with all its barbarous and elaborate system of tortures and murders, putting to death millions of people. 
The Jesuits reckon it among the glories of their order that Loyola himself supported by a special memorial to the Pope a petition to reorganize that cruel and abhorred tribunal, the Inquisition. Under the shadow of that hellish monster, the infernal flames of the most vile persecution were stoked, while the Jesuits looked on with a sinister and diabolical smile across their faces. The Jesuitical oath, which of course they deny, but nevertheless faithfully practice its obligation, is as follows. I now, in the presence of Almighty God, the Blessed Virgin Mary, the Blessed St. John the Baptist, the Holy Apostles St. Peter and St. Paul, and all the saints, sacred hosts of heaven, and to you, my ghostly Father, the Superior General of the Society of Jesus, founded by St. Ignatius Loyola, in the pontification of Paul III, and continued to the present, do by the womb of the Virgin, the matrix of God, and the rod of Jesus Christ, declare and swear that His Holiness the Pope is Christ's Vice-Regent, and is the true and only head of the Catholic or Universal Church throughout the world and that by virtue of the keys of binding and loosening given to His Holiness by our Savior, Jesus Christ, He hath power to depose heretical kings, princes, states, commonwealths, and governments, all being illegal without His sacred confirmation, and they may be safely destroyed. Therefore, to the utmost of my power, I will defend this doctrine and His Holiness' right and custom against the usurpers of the heretical or Protestant authority whatsoever, especially the Lutheran Church of Germany, Holland, Denmark, Sweden, and Norway, and the now pretending authority and churches of England and Scotland, and the branches of the same now established in Ireland, and on the continent of America and elsewhere, and all adherents in regard that they may be usurped and heretical opposing the sacred Mother Church of Rome. I do now denounce and disown any allegiance as due to any heretical king, prince, or state, named Protestant or liberals, or obedience to any of their laws, magistrates, or officers. I do further declare that the doctrine of the churches of England and Scotland, of the Calvinists, Huguenots, and others of the name of Protestants or liberals, to be damnable, and they themselves to be damned who will not forsake the same. I do further declare that I will help, assist, and advise all or any of His Holiness's agents in any place where I shall be, in Switzerland, Germany, Holland, Denmark, Sweden, Norway, England, Ireland, or America, or in any other kingdom or territory I shall come to, and do my utmost to extirpate the heretical Protestant or liberal doctrines, to destroy all their pretended powers legal or otherwise. I do further promise and declare that notwithstanding I am dispensed with to assume any religion heretical for the propagation of the Mother Church's interests, to keep secret and private all her agents' counsels from time to time as they entrust me, and not to divulge directly or indirectly by word or circumstance whatever, but to execute all that shall be proposed given in charge, or discovered unto me by you, my ghostly father, or any of this sacred convent. I do further promise and declare that I will have no option or will of my own, or any mental reservation whatever, even as a corpse, but will unhesitatingly obey each and every command that I may receive from my superiors in the militia of the Pope and of Jesus Christ that I will go to any part of the world whithersoever I shall be sent. End of the Jesuitical Oath We come now finally to the strategy of the Jesuits. Their first strategy is to completely control the papacy. Since their restoration in 1814, the Jesuits have sought to control the papacy. This they have largely succeeded in accomplishing. 
So great is the power of the general of the order, that as we have seen, he is called not only by Protestants, but by Roman Catholics the Black Pope. He is in fact the Pope maker or breaker, as the case may be. Many of the influential societies of the Church are subservient to the Jesuits. Among these are the Redemptorists, a suborder of the Jesuits, who act willingly or unwillingly as the serving brothers, the road makers, and the laborers for the Jesuits. The St. Vincent de Paul Society, the Brothers of Christian Doctrine, the Brothers of the Congregation of the Holy Virgin, beside many female branches in schools, convents, and hospitals throughout the whole world. Second strategy, infiltration. Dean Good in his book Rome's Tactics ably deals with the Jesuit infiltration of the Church of England. He shows how Jesuits have become professedly members and ministers in the Church of England, that in the guise of Anglican priests and laymen, they might undermine the Protestantism of that Church. For their work in this direction, they have been praised by the papacy. The other main Protestant churches have also been infiltrated in the same way, and their takeover by Rome carefully prepared for. The third strategy, conditioning. By character assassination, they seek to silence every voice raised in exposure of their aims. Where they have power, they remove by murder their opponents. They are adept in the use of the poison cup and the murder dagger. The Jesuits' defense and support of the Inquisition is a well-known historical fact. By controlling the press and broadcasting, The process of conditioning the people is skillfully manipulated. Every Protestant should ask in view of these facts, can I continue to trust those Protestant leaders who are continually under the influence of Jesuit priests in the ecumenical dialogue? An illustration of this is found in the newsletter of the 4th of this month, 1984 where three Protestant ministers show themselves to be the dukes of the Jesuit order. The Reverend Harold Good, Methodist. The Reverend Tom Craig, Presbyterian. And the Reverend Noel Mackey, Church of Ireland. Attacking me for calling the Jesuits the Gestapo of the Roman Church. These clergymen go on. I quote, It is our personal experience that members of the Society of Jesus, Jesuits, in Northern Ireland, are indeed dedicated to their calling to commit themselves to Christ and His work through service to the community. In particular, we know that members of the Society have made an outstanding contribution toward the healing of division in our province and have earned the trust and respect of Catholics and Protestants alike. These three clergymen are dukes of the Roman Catholic Church and dukes of the Jesuit order. They have swallowed the bait, hook, line, and sinker, and have now become self-appointed advocates of Jesuitry and defenders of the Jesuits. How the Jesuits must sit back and laugh when they see how successful they have been in their operation. Rome's tactics. She asked for toleration some 100 years ago. She was so innocent, she said, was wrong to treat her so. It really seemed a pity that England should remember such trifles as the Smithfield fires and Guido Fox November. Our senators imagining there really was a change, admitted her to Parliament and gave her system range. She took her seat so modestly and seemed so very quiet that many people wondered at the anti-Popish riot. But then, as now and ever, the woman wore a mask. Apostasy or aim was to subjugate her task. The first she has accomplished. The church has gone astray. But subjugation turns the scale a bit the other way. She says, my church is holy. My popes are holy too. 
my father's brothers, monks and nuns. What holy things they do. The evils you may hear of may fill you with disgust, but no, the holiness of Rome may never be discussed. I ask for toleration. You give it, but I give. No toleration where I come. All perish if I live. And o'er the sleeping country I pass with lengthy strides. For if I conquer Britain, I have no foes beside. What say you, men of Britain? You know the woman well. A perjured thing, a murderess. A woe unspeakable. Blighting the fairest country, which bends beneath her sway. Pray answer, will you take her within your homes today? Stand up then, stand together. Stand out and make her known. For where she gains a footing, she never comes alone. She comes with revolution and anarchy and change. For thought itself is spattered where the scarlet woman reigns. No blustering crowd is needed. We meet our foes like men. Hear what they say and claim the right to have our say again. Would God our feeble voices were steeped in living power to rouse our fellow countrymen in this insipid hour? God hold the lives of any who mount above the crowd with honest heart and burning lip amid Rome's curses loud. He sitteth king upon the floods, and on a given day, one of his mighty seas shall sweep that godless thing away. The timely words of Mrs. M. A. Chaplin. This brings me to the end of this tape on the Jesuits, the black pope and his murder men. I trust you will get many copies of this tape that you will give it the widest possible circulation, so that truth and its light will dispel the darkness and the falsehood, and that Ulster Protestants especially will know exactly who the Jesuits are, who the black pope is, and what is the origin, and what is the strategy, and what is the goal of the Jesuit order in Northern Ireland. And those Protestant clergymen who are dupes of the Jesuitical system, who are seeking to undermine and betray our Protestant faith and heritage, spurn them as a plague, obey the scriptures, come out from their churches and from their associations, and stand true to God in this evil day of apostasy and declension. The Church of Rome thinks that through the ecumenical movement she will take over the Protestants of this land. Let her know that there are 7,000, even in this day, who haven't bowed the knee to the papal bill. And with the sword of God and the strength of God, we will resist to the death her machinations, idolatry, tyranny, priestcraft, and popedom. May God make us faithful unto death, and then we shall receive the crown of life.